So we're going to do a bit of time travel tonight. I haven't quite got 50 years. 50 years is amazing. I've got 40 years. I'm just entering my 40th year at Marshalls. So as, as Caroline said, I started in 1984 as an apprentice at 16, straight out of the local village college. And I'm going to take us back in time. I did think about being the ghost of Christmas past and Steve being the gross ghost of Christmas future. But I've actually got a bit of a Doctor Who theme as we go through, which is which we'll see. We're going to go back. So I'm going to take you back 40 years, then 30 years, and 15 years, and then bring you bring you back to the present. And what we're going to try and do is talk about the skills challenge. There's clearly a skills challenge in aviation in the UK. That's that's in no doubt. I think as Marshall, uh, we've been somewhat isolated from that. We're a family-owned company. Um, retention is really good. So, you know, when I joined the company all those years ago, we had some great engineers. Actually, the chief aerodynamicist, as we were talking earlier, has, as he returned into a consultant, has only just just told me he wants to retire. Finally, I think he's, I think he actually officially retired about 15 years ago, probably. But he is finally starting to retire. So it is starting to bite, Marshall. And we'll talk about that in a little bit more detail. As I say, I'm going to then take you back looking at previous pathways that we've used, talking about apprenticeships, talking about uh, higher apprenticeships, and talking about graduate training schemes. And then talk a little bit about the future skills we require. A lot of people know Marshalls because of C-130, but we're a lot more than the C-130 MRO. Got quite a significant capability in Cambridge. And of course, we're looking bring that capability by 2030 to Cranfield. So we're going to set up a brand new facility in Cranfield and part of that, and that's the that's sort of the exciting bit, is what Steve's going to talk about, which is Skills Academy and how, how Marshalls is trying to help uh, the UK nationally uh, with aviation skills going forward. So that's, that's a sort of pre-say in terms of what we will cover tonight. Now, I'm not going to go through these in any detail. These are headlines. Um, Kathy Jenkins, our chief executive, did a skills summit. When was it? It was about two months ago, three months ago, something like that, uh, talking about how things need to change. Um, the last one really worried me. Four in ten apprentices quit their courses early. And we have had an unbroken apprenticeship scheme for over 100 years. I'm, I'm a product of that. And, and so apprenticeship for me, I'm absolutely a passionate about the apprentice schemes and what they and what they deliver. Um, and we don't only do marginal aerospace apprentices, we also do Bombardier apprentices. And I think these are some pretty stark um, headlines that, were, that, that we got from a recent survey. 78% uh, of apprentices interviewed hadn't used any hand tools in school. Completely different from when I was a lad. 83% of apprentices felt pressure to go on to study aerospace and go to university. 53% didn't know anything about aviation before applying to be an apprentice. And, 20, and we are now starting to get a 27% year-on-year decrease in applications. Historically, we've had, let's say, 30 to 40 apprentices maximum coming into the business, that sort of size. And we've had about 150 applications. And of those 30 to 40, about eight, six to eight of those end up in the engineering organization. So we've had a plenty of intake coming into the business. We're not, we're not of a size, not of a Rolls-Royce or, or British Aerospace to BAE to have the sort of scale problem. So I think we've been isolated. But in the last five years, I've seen a real change in Marshall. I've seen this, this happening, and I've also seen the, the middle tier, so people of my age getting to that point in their careers and looking back, and we've got a lot of people about my sort of, you know, 50 plus, we've got quite a lot of youngsters coming through from this apprenticeship scheme, but actually the people in, in the middle and trying to recruit those people with the right experience for the type of work that we will do, that I'll show you as we go through that presentation, is getting really, really quite difficult. So why Marshall? When I first joined Marshall, I saw MFS everywhere. It was on the, it, it was on the inspector stamps. Uh, it was on the, a lot of the um, uh, assets that we had. And I wondered, what's that? It was Marshall Flying School. And Marshall actually started the Avenitio, so Sir Arthur Marshall, uh, beginning of World War II, 
started the ab initio style of training. And through the Cambridge site, uh, we actually trained, it's an unbelievable figure, 20,000 flight crew came through Cambridge. Um, there were 700 that came through Cambridge before the end of the Battle of Britain. So they made a significant difference uh, to the war effort. So from a training perspective, Marshall has got some real credentials. And indeed, of course, in its apprenticeships. We've already mentioned 100 years of unbroken apprenticeships. This guy here, this guy here, Robin Lipscomb, trained me. He's still training apprentices today. Quite incredible. So it's amazing. Um, Doctor Who, I said, I happen to like Matt, Matt Smith as Doctor Who, so I, I chose him. And he's going to take us back now to about 1984. So 1984, I just left uh, Cottenham Village College, if anybody's heard of Cottenham, little village just north of, north of uh, uh, Cambridge. Uh, I did metalwork and woodwork and technical drawing. I was pretty good at technical drawing. I uh, managed to get uh, an A, it was the only A I got in technical drawing. And I thought, I'm going to go and get an apprenticeship at Marshall. So I wanted to, I actually wasn't, wasn't bothered at the time about aviation. I wanted to be an engineer, that's what I wanted to be. And I really wanted to be a draftsman. And I uh, did my apprenticeship, did the normal thing, went around, went around the business, went into the hangars, cut my teeth, learned how to print, because of course it was on the drawing boards at the time. And this is me. Yes, that's me here. It's like this guy had just won. <laughs> He just won the, uh, the Apprentice of the Year, and I won Best Achiever. Oh, I, was, I was absolutely heartbroken. That's why I'm not looking too happy in that picture. Interesting. No, 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 he's not. He's not. He's, he's, interestingly enough, this guy, I'll, I'll try and see if the pointer works. No, pointer. So this guy here, you see this guy just behind here, Chuck Darren blue t-shirt. He's now a senior fellow in data analytics and predictive analysis at Boeing. So he's definitely come. I'll tag up with him. He actually is from Soham, the same place that I now, I now live. So from Soham to Boeing via Marshalls. Quite incredible really in the senior fellows. We talked a little bit actually about those technical parts before we, before we started. Um, now this is me doing what I wanted to do. This is me being a draftsman. So this is about 1989-ish. Uh, I'm working on DC-10-10 30 freighter conversion for McDonnell Douglas and I'm using Rotring Ink. Now that was a pain in the backside if anybody ever used Rotring Ink. We used to use plastic on Mylar. McDonnell Douglas used uh, Rotring Ink so we had to do that. That was a, that was a real pain. And then a little bit after that, leadership role. Uh, this, many people know we, we've got quite a long pedigree in fuel tanks. This was actually taking one of the RAF TriStar tanks that we developed and putting it on a TriStar for Delta, uh, Delta Airlines. Um, this working, working in here. And I think one of the key things at the time, Di Jones there, was my, was my head of structures, a mentor for me. Uh, he died very recently, very sad. Uh, but, but when I was in that business, I was working with people who'd worked on Concorde. I was people that worked on TSR2. I learned an awful lot from their experience. Absolutely vital. Um, and I think that sort of whole aircraft design in this country is now missing. And uh, you can't, you can't, you can't replace that experience. Absolutely, you can't. And shortly after that, we did this. So I don't know how many people know. A long time before Virgin thought about it, 30 years ago, uh, 1993, we flew this. It was for orbital science. We never launched it in the UK. It was launched in America. It's done, I think it's done 35 uh, launches, successful launches anyway. I won't say how many launches it's done in total. I think it's only had three unsuccessful launches. Um, it weighs in at uh, over 50,000 pounds, 23 tonnes. Uh, so I think at the time it represented uh, the largest, uh, largest object to be dropped from an aircraft, I believe, at the time. And so that was a program. I actually did the, the initial scheming of that when we were bidding for it. Uh, and then Marshall decided to send me to university. And I often look back now and think, actually, I wish I'd been there to do this. 
rather than going at university because this was quite an amazing quite an amazing program yeah so i worked on the bid we did we did the we did two configurations in the uk flight testing at cambridge so we did the safe safe carriage and also a configuration that after you dropped it so once the doors are open or everything else so all that flight testing was done went across to edwards air force base in 94 some 38 total drops 35 successful but it was all designed and built using those very traditional techniques i was talking to uh, one of our flight sciences guy he did the release calcs on an early version of x based upon aerodynamic characteristics provided from uh, from orbital sciences using cfd but we did run into some problems on this uh, we as we were expanding the speed regime um, we actually got some got some buffet we introduced something called the bees bump which was a which was a which was a shape at the back to try and smooth off the back end we put vortex generators on yeah it was actually so bad that when you could go down to the into the mess which was the mid electronic service center you you and you put put a coin on the floor of that it would actually flip that's how bad it was it was actually sonic throw through sonic flow through and eventually we put brush shields on it i think that's on the next picture you can see those there um, those brush shields fixed the problem we probably wouldn't I don't know whether we would see that even today using modern CFD we probably wouldn't pick that up but through experience we got there quite a, one an, an early version of this actually through the wing fillet fairing of the Pegasus I'm too happy with us at that particular point in time so let's let's move a little bit further forward now oh it's an oh, it's an extra picture so yeah the b bomb went on to the back here you can see the fin going up into the, the hydraulic service center remarkably like the first scheme i i drew all those years ago never mind uh, another nice little picture and then we're going to move forward now so that was that was not that was very early 90s we're now going to use doctor who's tardis and move forward to about the year 2004 which I like to call my last proper job. So quite an interesting one. I think this one did tours of the Aero Society. People may have seen it. A chap called Rob Boyle and Martin Payne. Uh, and I think they dined out on this on this project uh, for quite some time. I did a big one. I did the, the Bristol one uh, on this uh, when we finished it. But that flew. Uh, first flight of that was 17th of December 2008 so we're just coming up to our 15 year anniversary and we're thinking about recreating the first flight booze up afterwards I'm a little bit older now so I don't think I'll be doing it but that was all about risk reduction um, actually at the time we'd win the Trent 1000 we didn't we never thought we'd win this one and we, we went ahead and of course the whole point of this program was to collect data so we had a we had a significant number of parameters uh, being measured so 800 analog parameters and over 2000 parameters from the ARINC 49 and AFDX networks and of course an interesting interesting problem because you had a fully digital aircraft on an analog sorry fully digital engine on an analog aircraft that aircraft actually we modified back in everybody know Snoopy the weather ship so in 1972 that came in got modified and then somewhat years later it came back so it's had a really interesting past actually that one we've now all only got the nose only got the nose left which is a great shame um, but we were using we'd moved on from Excel we were using on tools uh, we'd embraced uh, 3D, 3d design with Katia v5 We'd got Nastran for Windows. We'd use we were using scanning for reverse engineering, and we'd had we also we augmented our apprentice training scheme with a graduate training scheme as well. So we were bringing through graduates. They were learning based upon this type of work. Really interesting, really interesting work. And we were also doing the higher apprenticeships. Um, and this this was a clearly this was a. a did wonderful things like this. Hold on, Whitey. Now, is this going to work? Maybe I have to do that. Mm -hmm. Oh, it does work. Hurrah. So, flutter model. We were worried about well flutter. And 
we had a marginal marginal stability or marginal instability quick good question but nevertheless we we because of the test bed we put in some additional damping so we took a damper off a lynx a leg lag damper and put it into two struts that came out, came away from the fuselage and we had a set of conical sp conical uh, washer springs that would give us a breakout for such that at a certain load we would connect the engine to the fuselage which is the last thing you want to do good news is we were successful the flight was safe whether we ever needed it or not probably couldn't tell you but who cares the the, the important thing was We'd worked through it. We'd take we'd taken appropriate mitigation. We carried out a very very safe flight test campaign, and we'd we'd put it through. Uh, so we got successful service results for Airbus, and we learnt an awful lot for, awful lot from it. Those graduates that we had. So we cut the front end off a C130. We had a six degree freedom model of the of the HERP. We got the engine deck uh, to, uh, to uh, from uh, to, from Europe. So we can have the characteristics, the aerodynamic effect over the wing, everything. Uh, we could we could conduct uh, handling techniques, the test points and failure modes of the engine. We could do all this, and this was built by our graduates, 100 percent, with a bit with a bit of assistance from our then consultant. He was our chief designer, a chap called Tom Webb, a very great engineer. Um, he's only just recently retired as well. Um, um, and and of course the hand again. I hope this is going to work because this is quite. Look up here. We had match. We had we had a that there is the power. So comparative power. They'd fly on match power. It's about 11,000 shaft horsepower. I can't remember what the what the C130 is, but you can see you can see the amount of control inputs. If I run that again, we'll do that. You can see the amount of control input when he when he does the slam that the pilot is having to make to hold the aircraft steady. But all that was done. We actually achieved, achieved a max max power takeoff, uh, achieved all the test points that Airbus military a chap called Alan Cassier, who was the chief engineer at the time, to be able to go and to go and fly that. And of course, we used MATLAB, MATLAB at the time. So we were bringing in, bringing in new tools, new techniques. We had graduates who could use them. We had apprentices who really knew how to fit the stuff to the aircraft. A bit more. So we're coming forward now. Oh dear, oh dear. This is me. This is the other guy. It's a shame I can't him out. A chap called Kieran Maskell. Um, he also taught me as an apprentice, and we came together. So I'm much quicker than me, and when he put the verniers on it, it was bob on. I don't know how he does it to this day with a file, but he got he gets it to within, within a thou. It's incredible. But those skills aren't necessarily what we need now. Yeah, they, they were great at the time. I mean, I'm so pleased to have done, but we need some different skills. And obviously we come into Cranfield, and Cranfield gives us a brilliant opportunity to make some, make some real difference in the country. Um, this picture actually, I mean, it's, it's quite interesting because it's got a couple in there as well, a special mission, but it does have C-130s as, as a backdrop. And we're not just about C-130s. It's a big, big, big piece of our, of our uh, uh, business, but we are definitely not just about C-130s. So we do all sorts of other stuff as, as well. So my team, uh, we've got Marshall Fleet Solutions as part of our, part of our business. Uh, the, the MD uh, gave a really nice sound bite. Apparently, every piece of frozen food that you eat has been touched twice by Marshall. In some way, they've been in, been in a fridge. So what we do is we do refrigerated transport and we also do storage. So the Tesco's click and collect vans, for example, the fridges on there, thermaking fridges, are all serviced by Marshall engineers. And so we've done a We've worked with them to get solar panels on the roof, replace the diesel engines so they can go into the U U ULEV um, areas and not have to run their diesel engines overnight. Obviously, we've got Ocado as well, various others, Sainsbury's that we do, but it's a really interesting snippet. Uh, we have a FutureWorks uh, division as well, which is where a lot of our engineers uh, go, do something different. Um, they're, they're, at the moment, they're working on a project called uh, LilyPad, which is drone-based inspection of the farms. So the idea is that you have effectively a, a control center on land. You have a remote garage, remotely, remotely operated. 
you initiate the fact you want a you want one of those drones to to go and inspect inspect a a turbine. Uh, it, it, it automatically comes out. It flies to the flies to the turbine. The turbine blades obviously stop, but they could be in any position. The drone then acquires where that is using lidar, and then it comes and then does a does a visual inspection. At the moment, they do that sort of thing from boats trying to control drones, and of course that that's problematic for certain sea conditions and everything else. So that's one of the things we're doing. We've also announced very recently Marshall, GKN, and Parker, I think together with Megat as well, an MOU to explore liquid hydrogen fuel system solutions. So a lot of the skills that ATI put out in their in their uh, Fly Zero is it agenda are very very similar to what we need. And we're not going to get those skills if we can't get the, the children interested in engineering. We've seen those early statistics of the apprentice, you know, even our apprentice recruitment going down and down and down and down. And we know the skills challenge um, that we have in, in, the, in, the, uh, in the country. So I'm going to hand over to Steve now to talk a little bit about what we're going to do about it. Steve. Good evening, everyone. It's rather warm in here. I thought uh, it's perfect timing that the summer should turn up now that it gets dark when I should be sat in my garden with a, a gin and tonic and, and frankly, yeah, getting warm as we've all gone back to work. Um, good evening, everybody. Thank you so much on behalf of Master of Skills Academy uh, about the education, uh, education system, the challenges, the models and, and what we're sort of thinking of doing to try and look at this. Um, it's an honour to be invited to talk about education. I love talking about education, which coincidentally is usually why I don't get invited to many places, um, at least not dinner parties, sadly. Um, however, hopefully today what we are going to talk about will sort of stimulate conversation. And the thing I joke about me loving to talk about education always, I think, deems a little bit of irony because whenever I speak to anybody else about education, it is something that will always stimulate some really interesting conversation. And I think, on reflection, quite simply put, the reason for that is one common ground that everybody has in this room. Common in the sense that we have all been through an education system of some form, but interestingly and paradoxically, completely different depending on a number of things. Your versions of what your primary school was like will be different to the person sat next to you perhaps. You perhaps went to a middle school you perhaps went to a comprehensive school. You perhaps went to a grammar school. You perhaps went to a technical school. You perhaps then went on to college. You perhaps then went on to an apprenticeship. You perhaps then did university. You perhaps might have jumped in between a few of the others. You perhaps might have gone through education in the private sector. All of these experiences give us as human beings a really, really unique but different frame of reference as to what the education system was and is. And we're going to really explore that and talk about that a little bit more. Um, it is really important, and I mean really important, for me to mention, for reasons that I'll go into, that I will say that I want nobody to leave this room thinking that myself or Marshall are giving the education system a bashing, right? because we're not. I've worked extremely closely with the education system from early, early years, EYFS, all the way through to further education and will continue to bang the drum that our teachers and senior leaders and learning support assistants and teaching assistants, they get out every, they get out of bed every day with the single belief that they're making a difference in a child's life and they absolutely are. What I'm going to be talking about is they are really making do with the very best with what they've got. And it isn't the teachers and it isn't the staff that's failing and stopping our beautiful aviation industry from getting the people we want and we need so desperately, it sits at a bit of a higher level than that. Okay, so without further ado, I'm gonna talk about me. And that isn't because I want to talk about me, but interestingly, for the context of this brief, my journey into aviation kind of hits off all the points that we wanna talk about. So I went to school at grammar school. Now, interestingly, Historically, from my own experiences, if you lie north geographically of Derby or Nottingham, most people thought, if because I went to a grammar school and didn't particularly speak with an accent, I was a posh kid. That's what I got. I'm also a Peaceburg United fan who are also called the posh, so that caused loads of confusion. But they used to say, oh, posh, silver spoon, they used to say, went to a grammar school. Uh, 
it wasn't anything to do with that. I went to a grammar school because when I finished primary school, I had to sit this test called an 11 plus and I passed it. And they said, do you want to come to the grammar school? And I thought, yeah, that sounds good. Off I went, went to a grammar school. Now, I enjoyed school, got through it fine, it was lovely. But I must say, as a 12, 13, 14, 15 and 16 year old young person going through that education system, that school told me that I had to get good GCSEs, not just in three subjects, across the board, had to get good GCSEs. And back then it was a grade B and above. It's a target grade B or an A or an A star. Once you've done those and you get those grades that's that high, you're going to stay here and you're going to do your A-levels. Super. And then when I've done my A-levels, what I'm going to do then is go on to university and get a good degree, even better, by the way, if you could get in the top four that was then of the universities, get a good degree and then be successful. Off, off you'd go and be successful. Now, that was all very interesting and it was fine. And I went through and I did my GCSEs and I did all right. I did get a couple of Cs, which really annoyed the school, but I got enough to stay at A-level. And, uh, and I went into a hall, quite similar to this, and I got my certificate. My head of year met me and said, well done, Steve. You've got an A star in English literature, so you're going to do an English A-level. You've got an A star in religious studies, so you're going to do Christian theology. And you've got an A star in physics, so you're going to do physics. Is that all right with you? Yeah, I'm 16. And to be honest, I just want to go home because it's a summer holidays. So I enrolled and that was they were my A-level choices. Now, in hindsight, looking back, I'm not quite sure what I thought I was going to do with English literature, Christian theology and physics. And I'm, and I'm also starting to think that the school didn't particularly know either secretly. But hey ho, onwards we go. So into A levels ago and I start these three subjects and I just start thinking, oh, this is a bit boring now. I don't know if I want to do this. And I got a Saturday job fixing TVs and DVD players at a local sort of uh, repair shop, I guess, like a maintenance shop. It's not there anymore, sadly. It's a, it's a Weatherspoons pub, which is great because it's cheaper beer, but sad that the electrician shop's gone. Um, but I, I got a passion and a bug. I was like, actually, I quite like fixing stuff. I quite like this. I like that there's a problem. I like opening it up and I like looking at it and using test equipment. I thought, oh, shame I never did any of this at school. This is kind of fun. And there was a gentleman who sat to my left and he was kind of my coach and mentor. And when I broke things or put too much solder on, he would tell me off and, and fix it, frankly. He was an RAF engineer. He was literally doing this on a Saturday because he knew the owner, so he was helping out in the workshop. And he said, do you like this sort of stuff? I said, yeah, 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 it's really, really interesting. And he said, you should come and work, you should come and do what I do, I fix aeroplanes. I like, do you really? He says, yeah, yeah. And I said, I'd love to fix aeroplanes, but do you know, I'm not sure this whole A-level in degree thing is gonna be for me. I think, I'm, I think I might go and do something different. And he said a line that stuck with me and it's stuck with me ever since, and I will say it more, he said, you don't need a degree to fix an aeroplane. I sort of looked at him, I said, don't you? And he said, no. So anyway, a few weeks later, he whips me in and he says, look, come and see what I do. He, he picks me up in his car, we go to RAF Wittering, he takes me into a Harrier, uh, into the hangar and shows me the Harrier airplane. And I look at this hangar full of T-10 aircraft and think, well, I can work on this. I said, yeah. He said, better than that, the RAF will pay you to come and do this so you can learn on the job, we'll give you food, we'll give you uniform, and then when you pass your apprenticeship, you can come and fix these aeroplanes. I thought that's too good to be true. Anyway, two thousand. I've joined the RAF, and guess what? My first posting is with number one fighter squadron, GR7s, GR9s at RAF Cottesmore, on, of course, the greatest aeroplane. And I will argue with anybody about this: the greatest aeroplane to grace the skies, which was the Harrier. Um, absolutely amazing. I, I completed my apprenticeship, went to the dream place. Unfortunately, of course, with the time, this was 2002, so 9-11 had happened and it looked like the conflict was going to happen. So I spent, out of the seven years I was on them, I spent about nearly, nearly four in Kandahar, Afghanistan, on operational tours as part of OPERIC. And of course, um, working with the Navy and Maritime on HMS Illustrious and HMS Ark Royal. Absolutely fantastic experiences. I found a trade. The RAF has paid for me to get qualified to fix these things of beauty. This is going to be me forever. Perfect. <sighs> then they promoted me, which should have been a real good thing. But they said, Steve, Steve, you've, you've done too many times away at war. We're going to get told off now. We're going to have to take you off the first line. I said, right, OK, what am I going to do? They said, you're going to go and teach new apprentices. And I went, no, I'm not. 
Absolutely not. I said, I want to fix things. That's what I wanted to want to fix. And they said, we know you want to fix things. Just go and teach people how to fix things. Then you can come back and fix stuff later. And I was like, right, OK, I'll do it. So I got posted to what was a wonderful job at 238 Squadron based at the Defence College of Aeronautical Engineering. Uh, we had Jaguars, but we also had some Sea Kings. We had some, some, some Gazelles. We had the Tornadoes there. We had a great fleet. It is quite a thing if anybody's had the luxury to go and have a look around there. Um, and that is where I would say the bug for education got me. If anybody's ever stood in front of a class and taught and you get this moment, some people, they get weak at the knees and they don't like it, like this isn't for me. I was the opposite. I got a real passion in going, I've got to teach you this. How am I going to figure out a way that makes it fun and enjoyable for everyone in this room so you get it and you get it really well? So I really, we got the bug and I did it and I did it for nearly six years and I loved it, but I got involved in all kinds of other projects, implementing the first virtual learning. We did a whole instructor development program because I identified that we kind of brought instructors in. We gave them a two week course and we let them get on with it. I said we could do better than this. We can do better. Um, and I kind of then utilized what is the beauty of being in an employment by an organization like RAF, although Marshall do something very, very similar. And they paid for me to do a degree, and then they paid for me to get my qualified teacher status, which was incredible. So at this point, I'm working alongside some of the local schools, working in the governance, and really trying to shape what we're doing in FE to apprentices to what schools are doing. It's at this point, of course, I'm noticing that there are some slight disconnects between the two, which we'll come on to. I left the Air Force, and BAE Systems, in effect, found me. They found me on the wonderful platform that is LinkedIn. And they said, hey, Steve, you know a little bit about teaching stuff and you know about aeroplanes. Can you come and open up a, a new academy with the Aircraft Maintenance Academy up at Humberside? So I thought, yep, sounds like fun. And off I went and I did it. And I made the bold decision to leave the Air Force before the pension day. I did it before that 22 year deadline. I left and I said, I'm going to go and do it. I want to. Uh, it was the first time that BA Systems did what was called the license modules for Cat A and Cat B apprenticeships. Uh, it was the first time that those apprenticeships had ever been aligned to what is now the apprenticeship standards. So it was a bit of a complex job of trying to make all of those things work together whilst bringing them to business, but it was a great job. I did that for three years. They wanted to move me up to Preston, obviously Wharton, Salmsbury, which is a big presence. I took my wife to Preston. She wasn't so keen. I thought, this is going to get awkward now. What am I going to do? Uh, and then... <laughs> Then as luck would have it, a new school opened in Peterborough. It was called a University Technical College, lovely building, lovely site. They found me on LinkedIn and they said, Steve, you know a little bit about aeroplanes, you know a bit about engineering and you've done a bit of teaching and you've opened the place up. Can you come and help us open the school up? Because frankly, they'd been open for 12 months and had an absolute disaster. And I thought, yeah, sounds like fun, why not? So off we went. So that's a brief history of me. And the reason that I've gone into that detail is because I will come back to some of those points um, when, we, when we talk about some other elements. Now, I went to a grammar school, so it's only some proper that I include some poetry in a history lesson as part of my brief today. So fortunately, a gentleman called uh, Steve Turner, I think his name was, yep, Steve Turner wrote a poem that I can remember because it's one sentence. And it is tremendously relevant to what we're gonna talk about today, which is that history repeats itself. It has to nobody listens. So there's my poetry lesson for you. Now, anybody who's worked in aviation, there's a different iteration of this poem that you've probably heard affectionately mentioned called Reinventing the Wheel, which is something I hear a tremendous amount in the education system and in engineering. Um, but it, I, I prefer that because it means I can quote poetry and then you'll all think I'm, I'm clever, I went to a grammar school and stuff. But let's talk about history, because history is good. The Education Act of 1944, We've just come out of, of course, a world war or coming out of, and the government acts, the government group, sorry to say, we need to try and figure out how we educate the next generation to match our social values that we've just fought so hard to protect and defend, but also now to make really clear demands in rebuilding quite, quite, you know, not just structurally, but metaphorically, rebuilding the United Kingdom. So, so how do you do that? And they said, well, okay, that's easy. We'll keep grammar schools because the idea for grammar schools is it will be selective, but it will focus on your academic subjects, right? It'll focus on your English, your maths and your science. And that will be a route for those children to go on and study at universities, such courses like medicine and law that need those more and more and more years. Yeah, cool, works, like it. Next, we'll come up with something called a technical school. Now, interestingly, the devil in the detail of the technical schools is they were still selective. These were not for people that just wanted to go and hit sheets of metal with hammers and make a mess of it. This was a selective school, but based on the skills that were needed at that time. So there was still a, select, a selection exam 
this kind of varied depending where you were in the country. Some of them said you had to do a practical test. Others were much more looking at engineering principles and applied physics and mathematics in engineering. The third type was the comprehensive school for the hoi polloi, for everyone else. And that would start to teach the subjects that those two perhaps weren't focusing on. I think that's quite a, quite a standard and quite a straightforward model. I think it covers kind of what, the, what society needs at that point. And again, it's being driven by a requirement that they needed to desperately change what they were doing in order to meet the requirements of the country. Makes perfect sense. But when we think about those, those three things, probably the question that we then start to ask ourselves based on the, the, the nature of this brief is why did the technical schools disappear then? Because they've gone. If you look at my experience where I grew up, I sat an exam, I had two options. I either passed that exam and went to a grammar school or I failed that exam and I went to a comprehensive school. And that's not to say there's anything wrong with a comprehensive school, by the way. If I didn't want to take the exam, I wouldn't have to. And you can go to a comprehensive school. But I passed it and my parents said, yeah, go to the grammar school. So off I went. But there was a technical school. And actually, it wasn't until about arguably eight years ago, I even knew what this meant. So why did they all disappear? Well, the first devil in the detail was they needed, the government needed to find the funding to build these. And anybody who knows anything about any kind of basic project management is that square footage equals money. And when you want to do technical stuff, shall we call it, you need to have some workshops, you need to have big spaces, you need to have expensive stuff in the workshops, right? So that was causing them a little bit of a headache. It's like, yeah, we could build a technical school in this town, city, wherever you may be, or we could just build a comprehensive school that only needs classrooms and a playground. So there was a bit of a natural bias. So some of them started to not even be built because of that. The second part, and this was an interesting point, a lot of noble people and big, big organisations in the UK were to say, have you got any land or space that we can redevote as a school? And a number of people came forward and almost uniquely all of the people said, you can have this grand, grand building if it's purposed as a grammar school. Please make your own assumptions there. I'm not going to say any more. But that was what happened. OK, so these lovely and that is why so many grammar schools around the UK still are in set in absolutely grand buildings with huge land if they haven't been sold to, to the private sector. The third was when they did make these tech schools, they made a bit of a, a bit of an error in translating what the purpose of a technical school was actually for. History repeats itself. It has to. No one listens. I'm going to mention this again in about 10 minutes time. They made a bit of a mistake about what the technical school was. OK, so they built it and they put them up and they even they said, right, we'll have a space like this. And this is going to be an, a mock up of a construction site, maybe or, or something in the practical bench fitting hand skills sector or whatever it may be. And then they didn't draw in any pupils because one, some people were scared off by the selective exam. Two, they didn't really understand what you meant by a technical school. And three, kids tend to follow where their friends go as well. Three massive influences. So what started to happen was the technical schools weren't getting the numbers. So what happened was the local authorities who back then used to run these schools, you know, your councils, they said, convert that to a comprehensive so we can fill it quicker. And those triangulation of things has happened as to why the technical schools as part of the Education Reform Act all absolutely disappeared. So what's happening now, right now in education affects our recruitment and why is that giving us the quite noticeable skill shortage in aviation? And back to, to Mark's point, excellently made, as a reference point for Marshall, crudely put, if we put adverts out for an apprenticeship start in September for 50 spaces, we will usually get around 150 apprentices. So if we buried our head in the sand, this isn't really a problem. Everything's OK. But working in our sector, we know that's a problem. And as we start to grow and visit new sites, this is all we hear now. We're not getting the throughput. When you get the throughput, we're not getting the calibre. When we don't get the calibre, they don't have the skill set or even a vague understanding of what a career in aviation can lead to. And I'm not going to get into the complexities of the, the word engineering, because even in our aviation sector, the word engineering can mean a tremendous difference. When I look at the skills he's got versus what I've got, I think, I don't think I should call myself an engineer anymore. But equally, the things I was trained to do and how I operate as an engineer were very different to what Mark needed to do. And you only start to look at that as you're moving through your career. So how the education system can stand a chance in keeping up with this is a real big challenge, which we'll talk about. 
History lesson number two, the e-baccalaureate, e-bac, 2010, the government said, we need to condense a curriculum, the planned implementation of learning that a school has, and it now needs to be measured. And they said, and I'm looking, so I don't want to get it wrong, it's got to include English, it's got to include maths and science, a modern or an ancient language, history or geography. You've got to teach them. You've got to teach them because that shows that you're showing the breadth of the curriculum that will help people be successful. Problem with that in the room that we're sat in is at no point did I mention anything there about technology, engineering design, engineering manufacture, product design, computers, digital. Absolutely no mandate for it. Now what started to happen in schools was Her Majesty's inspectorates were coming round and judging schools based on the GCSE grade that children are getting in those subjects I just mentioned. So my school that I'm running is now not as good as that school down come to my school anymore because they're, as I mentioned, they're doing really well at GCSEs. I want to I want to teach some engineering in bits. I want to teach I want to teach some skills that are going to get people into this sector, right? So how do I do it? How do I do it? Because the very education system are not dictating that we have to or that we should do. And that causes us a bit of a headache. Even if I go rogue and I say, right, I don't care what that school down the road's doing that's now got their Ofsted outstanding and they've put one of those massive banners that says Ofsted out and they're recruiting more numbers, I'm going to stick to my guns and I'm going to teach you technical subjects. As to the point around square footage, if I want to teach a technical subject, I need a room like this full of CNC machines, lathe, bench fitting, something of some value. And that's if we're only talking about hand skills. If we fast forward to potentially posh side of the equipment, it's even more money. Show of hands, do the government and would the government fund an initiative such as that to teach children under the age of 16 to learn those skills? Categorically not. That is not a thing. So what happens to schools that shell out all this money on the space, have to shuffle their budget quite significantly, is a new head teacher comes in after something goes wrong and says, can't financially justify this as a model. We can turn this into four classrooms. I can take in another 60 kids in year seven. It's about five and a half to six thousand pound grant to a student. I've just made my school 360k in one sitting. Out goes your technical education. And that is a sad reality. I'm the chair of trustees to a local trust in a Lincolnshire multi-academy trust. And as soon as we had to meet as a trustees and say school financial performance is struggling, we knew that one of the like red flag is they'll ditch their one technical subject that they're offering because it's too much. Even if I'm still going to do it and I'm still losing money because it's costing me a fortune, there's then this little nugget. And this has probably been my largest headache in my career to date, which was working in a do this and then try and find someone that can teach it. Because there's a few problems with it, right? The first problem is most people, Mark would be an amazing teacher. I would have loved to have had him. And I got him to interview and I said, Mark, what do you know about engineering? And he'd show me that presentation and it'd blown me away. And actually Mark's really engaging and captivating with our apprentices as he talked about it. be amazing to have the class say, Mark, look, come on, I'll give you the CPD. I'll give you a level five teaching qualification all for free. I'll guarantee you Friday, uh, Saturday and Sunday off. And you get half terms and Easter and it will be amazing. And he goes, yeah, brilliant. And I go, and here's your salary. He goes, <laughs> no, no, no. Teachers in the mainstream schools are not paid what people who can effectively, even if just even if we crudely put it as operating machinery or designing things. Nowhere near. So the only people that come into education out of that sector are people that, quite frankly, don't need for whatever reason that be and want to give something back. We get people who ordinarily don't want to do that job anymore for whatever reason it is and then they want to come into a school. The latter half there ordinarily don't have the right attitude and when they meet their first year 10 class where a couple of your students have had a particularly bad morning and they come in and say something really rude and square, it shocks them to the high heavens and they never come back again. The rotation of staff in an engineering faculty at schools is frightening for those kind of reasons. And the final one is careers guidance. Now this is tricky. 
and this is tricky from both sides because I'm here today to talk about how we can help the schools, but the schools aren't just thinking about education. They're trying to think, how can we give a human being a broad opening of, of all the amazing opportunities that there are in this world? Um, Careers Guidance has been plagued by something called the Gatsby Benchmark, and the Gatsby Benchmark was set up and it provided a set of measures that said to a school, right, you're all doing careers guidance, you're all making a pig's ear of it, frankly, so here's another spreadsheet for you to do and you've got to do all this stuff, provide me evidence, check it off, and then Ofsted will leave you alone for careers guidance. The downside to that happening is you may have worked, the Royal Aeronautical have done some, your organisation respectively might have done some amazing outreach in the schools, um, but you need to understand, with my position of being a senior leader in a school, that amazing afternoon that you've probably spent months planning is a drop in the microcosmic ocean of what those teenagers are going to see through their school career. And that's notwithstanding the social fact about human beings. You could have just done the best session and had one human that was really captivated by what you're saying. They might even have come up to you at the end of that session and spoken to you, gone, I really want to do this. As they walk out those school doors and turn their phone on and see something they don't like on Snap, your interaction's gone and that day becomes random. So I was quite interested. My son has just finished year seven at a local school, which is a fantastic school. And I asked him, at the end of the academic year, what sort of careers guidance have you had? And he just looked at me with that sort of turning teenager glazed thousand yard stare sort of thing. And I went, which companies have come in and talked to you about things? And he said, oh, yeah, we had a day. I thought like, that's not really an answer. He said, we've had a day. We had to go into the hall and there was people all around the outside with flags and stuff. I said, right, that's really interesting. Thank you, mate. Um, contacted the school and I said, can you let me know out of curiosity which parts that you had um, and tell me a little bit about them? So they did. And they said, we were really proud of our careers day, Mr. Colby. Really proud of it. Kids were really well behaved. It was a lovely session. There was loads of gizits given out. And I said, like, brilliant. Who was there? And they said to me, we had interactions, two from the rail industry, one from the motor trade. We had two chemical engineering companies in. We had food manufacturing organisation. We had submarine engineers. Uh, we had the banking sector, the National Health Service, four lots of construction companies covering site management, quality assurance, bricklaying and estimating quantity surveying. Uh, and we had two lots of telecom industries, which was really important because one of the telecom industries focused on the making and the setting up of the infrastructure, and the other was all about the data management side and how they monitor how their broadband's doing out there. I said, that's brilliant. Thank you so much. So I said, Harry, can, which of those can you remember? And this time his eyes sort of rolled in the right way, and he looked at me and went, oh, hang on, and he left the room. And I thought, oh, he's going to bring back a piece of pen and paper, and he's going to recite this list back to me. He came back with a pencil that had the name of one of those companies on it. And he went, yeah, I remember them. They did a little game with us. I said, oh, OK, what was the game? He said, I can't remember. Careers guidance, year seven experience from an Ofsted outstanding school. OK, very tricky, very difficult to navigate. But that is the message that's happening. All of these factors here are what is causing us a significant blockage in the pipeline of even knowing, of even getting people to know what aviation actually is and the engineer actually is. So what can we do? What on earth can we do? Well, the first thing is, is technical schools, history repeats itself, it has to, nobody listens, and starting to reappear, and there are over 40 of them in the UK currently. The University Technical College I was at, of course, was one of them, and these are starting now to boast some incredible stats if you're looking at people who are going on into appre um, apprenticeships, if you're looking at who is staying in the science, technology, engineering, mathematics field, and, and basically staying in our sector, so to speak. Marshall, as an organisation, we're opening two more skills academies in the United Kingdom. Uh, one here at Cranfield, well, not here, just down the road at Cranfield University, uh, and one we've just opened at Oxford over in Canada. But the one that really tickles the senses of people is to tie in everything that I've said today. We, we know that schools don't have the money. We know that schools can't find the staff. We, we know that schools are struggling with effective career guidance. So what Marshall have agreed to do is utilising the model of a technical school. We will open our doors where our apprentices train 
and we will allow local schools to send students to basically learn a GCSE subject but at our facility. And that may well be a BTEC in engineering, it may be engineering manufacturing, it may be engineering design. I'm literally meeting with Cranfield University on Monday at talk with a load of executives. I know they want this. As I come back to my point that teaching staff and head teachers know they want to do this, but at the minute they're in a rock and a hard place with the how. So we are proposing, come and work with us. We will give you the experience. I will work with them to design a curriculum that actually gives them some hand skills, that looks at computer-aided design, that looks at how we design our way out of a problem, and actually utilizes some skills that we know humans really need, i.e. teamwork, collaboration. It's a great irony when you're teaching teamwork and collaboration, a lot of students think that they're cheating if they talk to each other. And we're like, no, 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 it's absolutely, it's, you're in a good space here. Please talk to each other. Don't just take someone's, you know, ask a question sort of thing. So we're doing that, that Cran Field will be launched in September of 2024. So hopefully we have a full cohort for that. And the project that they're going to be doing as a GCSE will be a smaller cut down version of the project that you saw Mark doing and what our apprentices do. So again, something that I know about young people, and in fact, probably all of us, someone's something that they're actually interested in, they will probably do well at it. And even if they don't, they will try and work harder to get better at it. It's when you give people something that they don't like and force them and tell them, no, this is the pathway. That's when you meet resistance. So we're really, really excited about running that. Um, we again, we hope this allows technical experience to be accessed from people that don't have access to it in their current school. So if they are at a school, we are offering that for people to come to. Uh, and again, when we talk about careers guidance, um, I'll mention, and Mark's already mentioned the skills summit, but this isn't a martial thing. So when it comes to careers guidance, I will be asking the Royal Aeronautical Society, I'll be asking people in this room, all the people you will have experiences that I don't have and that I don't know about. So what's really important is, well, you come in then and talk to them. They're here on Tuesday from one till four o'clock. They're going to do their practical from one till three. They'll restore the workplace. It's nice and clean. You've got half an hour to talk to them, but you won't stop at that point because they'll see you again in three weeks, then they'll see you again the next year. So we're constantly banging the drum of aviation to say it is such a broad field, it's such an exciting place to be. I mean, look at Mark's amazing presentation of the stuff you can do in our sector. It's incredible. The fact is you can't expect young people to not know what they don't know. Trying to work with the Royal Aeronautical and the good people about an outreach programme. We saw when I was at when I was at the, the University of Technology in Peterborough, BAE Systems had an incredible outreach program. The Royal Air Force had an incredible outreach program. The Royal Navy had one, Caterpillar had one, Perkins had one, Anglian Wartime, and it was all good because most of them were for different sectors. The aviation industry is too big. And what you find is you're all trying to fight for access to the same talent pool to probably do 80% of the same project anyway. We need to get a little bit smarter as a sector and say, if we're going to make an engagement with some young people, let's make it the absolute best it can be that reflects our industry in a really positive light. Some of the stats of the, the technical college that are popping up in the UK, that, that schools have to report on, is, which is when people leave then if they education, employment or training, that's a problem. Uh, nationally, the UTC, so the technical colleges have got 3% compared to 12% national. The big one, though, is the percentage of students leaving to start an apprenticeship, nearly at 20% there compared to about 5% nationally. And those at a degree or higher level, 63% compared to 20 nationally. And actually, while some people might talk, and I joked about, you know, universities not the only path, they're actually also boasting some stats that are beating the national average for how many students stay and go on to a level six qualification at uni. But 70% of those are sticking with science, technology, engineering and math, which what these technical schools are being measured on, they're absolutely succeeding with, which is brilliant news for the sector. Uh, this is Lord Baker. Lord Baker was one of the founding members of the University Technical Colleges. He provided us with a, a lovely letter that he wrote when he found out what we were doing. Uh, when we first started to inquire, we were thinking of trying to open up two schools of our own. Uh, unfortunately, to use the CEO's words, the DFE at the moment, the Department for Education, is in a bit of a state of paralysis and not much is happening, which is why we're experimenting with a different type of bringing, bringing the children to us and trying to support schools to get their technical education. 
And what's the difference? Well, the difference is, as we've mentioned, it's a well-designed curriculum that's supposed to be around a technical field. So we don't, the technical schools don't have to worry too much around delivering history, art and dance and drama. Not that there's anything wrong with those, but if you want to do that, don't go to a technical school. Learning should be deepened through the contribution of us and their university partners. Students should leave thinking more professionally minded with better employability skills and hopefully going on to progress onto ambitious destinations. It probably should caveat that with and of course staying in our sector and us not losing them. This was the skills summit that Mark mentioned and the quote at the top there, we're not going to find the talent of the future, we must make them, was from a fantastic speaker that we had called Tamara Holmes, um, quite a prominent character in the American aviation industry. Um, I love that quote. She actually used a metaphor about gardening, which made me feel a little bit embarrassed actually, because she said, how many people, when it comes to spring, summer, go to the garden centre and buy the little potted plants of the ready-made plants. I put my hand up all excited. I, I do that. I approve that. He says, yeah, yeah, that's what we need to stop doing. She says, you need to plant the seeds and you need to grow them yourself. And I was like, oh, I see where you went with that one. I walked right into the trap. But she's absolutely correct. Um, so we gathered the leaders of aerospace and aviation to address this skills crisis. And we were really honoured to be joined by 32 organisations, including uh, Aerospace Defence. I think the, the, the uh, CEO of um, of the Royal Aeronauticals is just just at the bottom of that staircase. He was there. Uh, business, aviation, academia and government. And, and we all kind of talked about really what I'm talking about today. But our objectives are place all of your whoever you work for aside. Now, we know this is a problem. And I've been working very closely recently with the construction industry on another project that Marshall got, which I'll save for another day. But the construction industry coined the phrase that construction is having a massive problem in skills as well but when the labour shortage continues to affect construction slows down the thing that we talked about here with aviation is when your supply of talent and design engineers and aircraft engineers runs out aviation stops and that's a significant worry isn't it for our sector um, we want to fast track the young people in the industry so we talked about the plans that we've got around the sleeve into the university technical colleges helping track young people delivering more sustainable long-term plans for how we get this pipeline not just a quick dip in the ocean if we'll do an outreach pocket you know here in Bedfordshire and then we might do one another day try and actually think of something that develops a pipeline routinely hopefully a well-informed pipeline with the skills want to come into our sector but also looking at trying to get to those underserved communities as well how can we reach out to them and try and show them that a career in the aviation industry is all for you not just because of the place in the United Kingdom that you happen to be living in at this moment in time so our final reflections my top one there the talent is out there I promise you my years with the education sector <laughs> teenagers I, I did a piece on personal branding and I put a picture up of a load of people with hoodies at a skate park and I asked the young apprentices what what's your perception of this and interestingly their response actually was chabs hooligans troublemakers and I was like well I didn't really expect that because that's what I would expect the perception of us that was my perception of it but it was theirs as well and I said what made you say that and actually the reflection was well that's probably what you think isn't it Mr Scott I was like oh well, okay that's interesting but working with these young people, when the baseball caps come off and the hoods go back, these are lovely young people that just want an opportunity in the same way that all of us did. The problem that we've got at the moment is they don't know. They just don't even know how to get into an industry like aviation and what that means to them. And that's heartbreaking. It really is. The lovely quote of insanity, doing the same things over and over again, expecting different results. It's a massive thing in engineering. We talk about being innovative and creative all the time, don't we? And then we get a skills shortage problem, and we all sort of go, what do we do? And you get two solutions. What do we do to the skills shortage problem? Number one, put my head in the sand and hope that somebody else fixes it. Or number two, we do what we've always done. We do a different outreach programme. We go into another school. We, we do something else. No one's ever really gone, let's just mix this up now. We've got to try something different because nothing is changing. You cannot, we cannot, one must not expect schools to be able to prepare and generate the next wave of talent into our industry. As much as it would be lovely to have, and I've always said it'd be great if we could have like our own aviation school, wouldn't it? That'd be brilliant. It'll never happen because of the constraints of funding, because of the constraints of academic requirement, because of the politics that you get in local proximities of areas. There's loads of things to consider, but we must not think as a sector, it's OK, the school is going to do this for you because they might let you in for that one interaction for that academic year. But as I've said to you, by the time you have walked out the door thinking you have done a great job, 
the other 150 organizations that they've met in that year have done a great job too, and it will get lost. The final part, we must collaborate. We've got to collaborate to get this right. And that is one of the main draws that I had to join Marshall and ultimately the Skills Academy is their belief that we're not doing any of this. A lot. We're not doing any of this for profit, which my CEO gets extremely cross at me when I come up with my ideas and she knows that it's just going to be cash out of the bank. We're doing this for our sector. And all of the things that we want to experiment with and try with and grow and develop and communicate, we're doing with an absolute belief that this will benefit the sector. And I think that is it. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you. What are your thoughts on engagement with primary school children and the importance of, of that? I, I did not prep that question, but our ambition, uh, so at the moment, University Technology, for those that know, they uniquely started recruiting at, age, at year 10, which is the start of your GCSE year, GCSE year. The reason that they did that uh, originally was just because they know that the transition to secondary schools is a challenge for young people and actually taking them out of year seven, eight and nine probably wouldn't make much sense. So actually you take them out of year 10 and you offer them a different technical curriculum around engineering. One of the many, many difficulties of trying to get young people to leave their current school and, and come to you as a technical school is that very first message that I talked about, about the bit of a pig's ear people made about what a technical school was. Tamara Holmes, the lady I mentioned who has, who has delivered this fantastic programme in America, she runs at weekends from her aviation, her, her MRO as we would call it, Saturday schools for people in primary to go and like do fun maths projects surrounded by aeroplanes. And it's a word that we don't really like using in education too much, but it's all about exposure. It is exposure to the industry and you're 100% correct. At the moment, it's really about learning to walk before we run. Let's get the GCSE programme in. Let's see some successful models in there. And then I will, quite frankly, just start moving left in the academic. And my absolute plan is really by the time that aerospace get to Cranfield in 2030, that we've already started talking with local primary schools about the exciting scheme that they can join that year, whatever it's going to be in time. But yeah, you're absolutely 100% right. It's got to be started there. My boss, the general manager, he actually wants to open up a like a creche slash nursery. A crash like he said what we should do he said because you've got a big buggy bugbear about the deprivation in Cambridge at the moment he said we should open up one of these and we should have them next door and then when we've got a safe space to do it we should let them come and play with some of the tools now all the engineers lost their mind and I mean no 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 we don't want that but that's the kind of innovative we just try to yeah to, to your point exactly yes we must get to primary schools and we must start to influence that conversation I actually think though as a as a society as a bunch of aviation engineers we do need to get a little bit better at knowing what we're all doing. I think there's a big gap there, and I think that needs exploring as well. You know, from my own selfish perspective, I work alongside our head of aviation. We've both got on paper exactly the same certificates that qualifies us to work on aircraft, but a completely different skill set. And that's people, you know, that's people who work next door to each other doing trials in the airport, working on the airplanes that my team to Marshall to fix, but I had no idea. There was a group of martial apprentices that had been taught a much more what we call kind of called depth maintenance, that skill set, and his apprentice had done that. So I think we've got to get better at that. And when we start to look at this collaboration message, when we start to engage schools and say, right, here's our amazing outreach program for aviation, it's going to have to be tailored, of course, when you go to a primary school. But I think that consistency in that message will, will probably be the defining factor as to how successful it will be. But I promise I didn't prompt that question, but that was just brilliant. Thank you. I didn't. <laughs> I'll just Thank take you. a question from the chat. So um, from Dan, how much do you think the role of elitism plays in decisions to A, not fund technical skills and B, students not take a technical skills route? So the question was, how much do you think the role of elitism plays in decisions to A, not fund technical skills and B, students not take a technical, a technical skills route? Snobbery. Yes, <laughs> I think so. I think that's the spirit of the question. Something that, something you know, coming back to the primary school, something that we tried to do, Robert Marshall was very passionate uh, about this, was Launchpad, which comes back into engagement with primary schools. Um, I think, I think, I think the elitism, I don't know, it's, it's, 
elitism in prime. I don't know. You, you, you're, yeah, you're, you're, you're probably better qualified. Out of so that this, this, this was there, there was a little allusion to that when I talked about some of the grand buildings being donated by by the wealthy, either as individuals or organisations. And there was a clear, but only if you're doing it to make a grammar school, not a not a technical school, not a not a comprehensive school. Um, the sheer fact of the matter is, as that's come up in politics at the moment, we have conditioned society to believe that the way to be successful is go through school, get good GCSEs, yeah, get your A-levels and go to university. And that's the message that we've been telling everyone. The problem, or the, perhaps a good problem to have, is that kids now are starting to not believe that, and they're right not to, because of the amazing opportunities you can get from an apprenticeship, which have always been there. They've been there for the past 10 years, you know, 10, 15, arguably more apprenticeships have always been there. They've had the challenges, they've had their complexities, they've had their funding issues, but there have been different routes where successful people have been. And we will all know in this room, a lot of people who have got tremendously successful in either their profession or their field without a degree. But that's not saying there isn't a place for degrees because, and, and, and my own parental view of this is if my son wants to go into medicine, I absolutely understand that he's going to have to be tremendously academic and he's going to have to be able to study a dance harder than I could at university because you need all of those extra years of experience to actually gain that qualification. That makes perfect sense. Um, but equally, when we talk about our sector, if you want to go into the design team, you do need a degree, but you can earn that from a degree apprenticeship. And what's better is the programme that we offer is you can come through and do a level three programme with us. So if you can do A levels if you want, but you don't need to, you can be 16 years old, you can come and do six months in our workshop at level three, learn all the intricacies of how bench fitting works, machine fitting, fabrication, you know, joining materials and all of that stuff. And then say, well, I did a placement with Mark and the design engineers. Can I come and work with you? I think, I think there's also the perception that I think we all know, which is about what an engineer is. I was, I was going to introduce a slide earlier on, didn't I? We talked about this. I had my tent model. I'm not sure it, I'm not sure it worked. It sort of made sense in my head at the time. But, but what is an engineer? What does an engineer do? I mean, bottom line is engineers build things. That's the bottom line. And I believe everybody loves to build things when they're kids. End of the day, be they build Lego, whatever it is. And somewhere along the way, that gets, that gets knocked out of them. And then there's this perception that you've got to go to university to get some. Now, not everybody is used to go to university. For sure, I don't think it was the right route for me. I'm very pleased that I went on later and I had that debate as I was going through my my my, uh, my piece of the lecture in terms of, you know, I'd actually, I think, have benefited more from staying staying behind and doing the, getting the experience. Um, but there are engineers that do need you know, the level of analysis that certain engineers need, the level of detail specialism. The level of maths and that side of education, perhaps. Yes, yeah, certain engineers do need to go through university. Absolutely do. Clearly, there's a balance. And there's, 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 and, and, and as well as that, you don't have to be an engineer to get excited about engineering and be an engineer. There's all the other things, the commercial, the purchasing, all those other facets of it, of, of to make a successful marketing. <laughs> the fact that we had a conversation about that earlier, didn't we? But you, you, you don't have to be an engineer to get excited about engineering. And we need the other parts of the business to come together to make a success of it. And all different types of, of uh, people coming together uh, to deliver it is, is really key. Not sure I've answered the question. Yeah, in the interest of time, we'll just do one more question. Let's go to the front. Yeah. It was just really an observation. Um, I was brought up in the Netherlands, so I went through Dutch education system and worked a lot um, in the Netherlands and a lot in Germany. And then coming back to the UK at a later age, um, uh, the, the engineering, especially aeronautical, it, it kind of it does fly under the radar. You don't really notice it's here. And especially in Germany, well, I mean, engineering, that is something to be seriously proud of. And it's really things that um, in schooling and everything, and especially with apprenticeships, it's a very serious apprenticeship. And it's something that really that people are keen to go to. Parents want their children to go to and everything. And I think, um, you know, when I hear what you're doing now, I think that's fantastic. It seems kind of England's lost the way or Britain's lost the way of this being this engineering country with 
you know, great, incredible achievements. My dad was an engineer, so I have to be very proud of <laughs> British engineering. But it just seems it's lost its way and it needs a you know, rebrand and, you know, really more promoted overall. Um, I, I saw this map and it was showing uh, UK space. Um, they've done this uh, digital map and shows it, all the whole industry. And if you see it online, you just kind of you're blown away. You think it's everywhere, but I don't see it. I think, you know, it's <laughs> But it's my observation, at least. Well, um, Mark and Steve, I need to go somewhere slightly brighter so I can read my notes. <laughs> um, uh, and yeah, for those online, I'm now standing behind all the audience. But uh, but anyway, uh, Mark and Steve, um, fantastic talk. Thank you so much a uh, huge amount of, of information that you that you poured at us <laughs> um really very interesting i picked out one or two things that were interesting to me um that that sort of 27 percent year on year reduction applications for apprenticeships that is really really worrying um uh, and yeah, that that really does need to be taken out. And you're right to say it's got to be up to us within the industry we can't expect somebody else to do it for us uh, the industry has to to get its act together, um, and and something Mark you were saying about the missing generation. Um, I have to say, everywhere I've worked, fortieth year. That isn't. There's always you know, there's lots of youngsters. There's a few guys at the top, and there's always a missing generation. And. Really, not sure how how you ever get around it. I think some of it is, uh, and you'll see it at places where you get good retention of staff because people will get so far and say, "I'm I'm never going to get up to the highest level because so and so has been here 30, 40 years." So you always lose a generation. But, but talent pipeline going through, so you can so you can get those people. Um, I won't blabber on too much, but uh, absolutely no uh, no argument at all about Harry being best plane ever. Uh, definitely there. Um, I, um, so I worked at, at BAE for about 10 or 15 years, so no question about that. Um, the yeah, I, I think it's very impressive what the UTCs are starting to push out. I wonder if maybe some of that is because there's only 40 of them so far, and by the time you get to 100 of them, you know, maybe the averages will have come down because you're attracting the best of the best at the moment. Um, and then I really liked your garden centre analogy because the idea of just going out and buying something that's already ready made, it's always more expensive. Actually, it's much better value to grow them yourself. And I think maybe that's, you know, it, it feels like it's expensive at the start. Obviously, saying, you know, it's just going to cost money. But actually, in the long run, I think it saves, saves you money. Um, as I said, tremendous talk, uh, lots for us to think about, lots for us to take away, and uh, hopefully those of us online and in the room can show our thanks in the normal way. Thank you.